Good evening, friends. As you can see, that I am sitting with a very renowned author and a very dear friend of mine, Anuja Chandramouli. I love her books, and if you haven't read her yet, please do because you will love her too. Uh, today we are in the last session of our uh, writing program uh, in collaboration with Rupa Publishers, season one. And you may uh, know that we have already declared the uh, registrations open for our season two. Uh, do register if you want to take our program. And I would like to uh, continue the conversation with Anuja. I would, uh, today we will talk about Anuja's book, Mohini something that I have loved, something that has been appreciated by everybody who has read it. I have seldom received or seen any kind of negative comment, not even any kind of disappointment, nothing. I mean, it's a great achievement the way Anuja has written this book, and I applaud her for that. Anuja, thank you so much for making time. And uh, I will thank you profusely once again at the end. <laughs> Before that, I would go ahead with the questions. Anuja, the first question that I had is based on research. You know, this question comes from the fact that uh, for any kind of writer who is starting off or even someone who is uh, a seasoned writer, research plays a very important role. And it is not just research. I mean, for your book, it requires a lot of research in a particular uh, space in a particular genre. But in every kind of writing, there needs a lot of research that what time is it based in, what location it is based in, what people do in such location, what is the community experience, how people do, and not everything we might know. There are certain things that we have, have to you know, uh, import. So I would like to ask you about that research aspect first, that how did you do your research for uh, 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 Mohini, and how did it go with you? So first of all, uh, hi, Koril. Thanks so much for all the kind things you said. It's such a pleasure and privilege to be a part of uh, Tell Me Your Story. Uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, initiative, and uh, I've really enjoyed being a part of it. Uh, so getting to your question about uh, research. Uh, see, uh, I think uh, since uh, I write on the subject of Indian mythology, I want to point out that um, you know it's something very sensitive to write on because uh, uh, unlike Greek or Roman mythology or Egyptian mythology, um, the characters, I, I can't, we can't call them characters, the gods and goddesses in Indian mythology are highly relevant even today. A lot of people worship them and uh, you know uh, they are in all our hearts, I guess, these gods and goddesses. So when you're writing about them, uh, I always try to make it very, very relatable for the reader. Uh, I try not to put the gods and goddesses on a pedestal where uh, they are, where they just are above us and unreachable and stuff like that. You know, I want to um, give some insight into what makes these gods and goddesses tick, what makes them resonate with us even today, why they have such a big place in our hearts. So, you know, I try to get up close and personal. So, uh, you know, I don't, um, uh, you know, uh, so sometimes for some people that can uh, come across as irreverent and, uh, you know, I want to make it very clear that I come from a place of respect, that I really, really treasure this material which has been handed down to us over the ages. And uh, one way to ensure that I do justice to it is to make sure that the research process is thoroughly conducted. So uh, I don't uh, make any compromises there. There are no shortcuts. As you mentioned, it's a lengthy process, a painstaking process. It takes a lot of time, um, but uh, I enjoy it. I love it. Uh, it's so much fun. When people think of research, they think of uh, nerds or geeks uh, sitting with spectacles. Yeah, I wear spectacles when I do my research, actually. But uh, yeah, so and maybe I'm a bit of a dork. Maybe I'm a geek, but uh, it's so much fun, you know, it's so much fun. The stories uh, uh, which get told aren't always the best stories. Sometimes the stories uh, which you stumble on across, uh, you know, while on the way towards another story, they may also have a lot of intrinsic value at the end of the day. I live for the stories. I love the stories. So I just love soaking it all in. I love... Uh, transporting myself to another age where the magic was real, where the gods and goddesses walked amongst us. And uh, I try to recapture some of that in the pages of my books. And uh, um, it's beautiful. I take handwritten notes. 
while I do my research. And invariably, the things which I don't write down are the things I need later. <laughs> so, you know, I'll have to bust my head and go back to it. I'll be like, oh my God, damn it. Why didn't I write the page number? Why didn't I take note? I know it's somewhere here. So you're wading through <laughs> thousand page tomes and you forget the point, uh, the, one, the little anecdote, maybe just a little. Sometimes it, might, it could just be a sentence I'm looking for. So I'll have to go back and um, I'll get sidetracked a lot when I'm doing my research because, like I said, there are so many interesting stories, so many characters um, beckon to you, you know. They want you to focus your attention on them. And I have to be like, ah, oh, like a horse put on blinkers and focus on the <laughs> character you're researching. So it's a really lovely journey, the research process. And uh, I love it. It's part of the writing process for me. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's how I kind of get started. Anisha, how does it go for you? Because there are two, uh, I mean, uh, two categories of research, if we may put it down in terms of when we research. One is before writing, we do the research. And the second is while writing, we do the research. So while writing, we are stuck and we figure out that there is probably something that we don't know and we need to fill in. And that is when we go up there. Uh, what is your process? Or yeah, is there like, something that you put more importance to, or it just happens to you simultaneously? Uh, I would like to say that I'm a very meticulous person, that uh, um, you know I do things by the book. But actually, when it comes to research, it doesn't work that way for me. See, while laying the foundation, maybe I'm uh, you know doing traditional research. Maybe I have certain texts in mind, certain sources in mind which I want to familiarize myself with. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, these sources are my constant companions throughout the writing process. Uh, but I also uh, believe that uh, when I'm working on something, uh, you know, um, I keep an open mind, you know, suddenly I might get a book for a review. I might pick up a book in an airport because life keeps intruding. Uh, I think we authors want to disappear into a little bubble while writing, but it um, doesn't work out that way. Uh, real life is always beckoning to you and it could be irritating but uh, I think over the years I've uh, uh, come to realize that if I keep an open mind something I read somewhere it could be a news article it could even be a tweet it could have some bearing on what I'm doing it could uh, shed some light on you know a particular plot point so I'm always fascinated when that happens when something unrelated maybe it's a song lyric maybe it's a folk song from Tamil Nadu uh, which you know gives me an insight into a character situation something like that so it's very very interesting how these influences um, come into your life when you're so immersed in this uh, process of uh, breathing life into your characters into you know uh, somehow making the pages come alive so uh, i just uh, love that i love when that happens it somehow makes you feel connected it makes you feel like you're a part of um, something that's bigger than you and gives you such a dopamine rush, I think. I think that's why we do what we do. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, here I would like to tell our viewers one uh, small uh, idea that might be of use for aspiring authors, that there are many groups today. I mean, there is Quora, one, of course. And there are many Facebook groups on creative writing, on mythology, on various topics, or just writing. So at times it happens that when we are researching and we are simultaneously writing, that is when you don't want to come out of the writing to focus yourself on back on research because it feels like you, know, you are stopping one process and getting into another. At that time, one quick thing that you can do is very uh, quick, I mean, uh, intelligently, that you can just go to one of the groups and type the question out there and let the people pour the knowledge onto you and you just have to do the filtering. So that often helps. Uh, Anuja, there's one question for you from Mona Verma, who is uh, another dear, dear author friend for both of us. She has asked, uh, there are so many versions and so many flavors of to the same story, especially when it comes to mythology. Uh, which one can we zero on in a very valid question? Too many versions, too many stories, too many ways of looking at it. How do we do justice? Uh, hi, Mona. Uh, so lovely that you've joined in and uh, i love your question so uh, um uh, if 
probably would be somewhat sacrilegious to say it because uh, uh, a lot of people tend to think that when it comes to mythology, everything is set in stone. Uh, but those of us who actually bother to do the research, we know that there are many, many, many versions, many flavors to the same story. Um, like you pointed out, for instance, I'll give you a small example uh, from Mohini itself. Uh, the Mahabharata is such a beloved epic. Uh, Indians all over the world are united by their love for it. Not just Indians, I think, uh, uh, you know, everyone who's been exposed to it loves it. And uh, there are so many uh, regional flavors which have been uh, added to the Mahabharata over the years. And um, uh, when I wrote my book on uh, Arjuna, I think I stuck pretty much to Veda Vyasa's version, but if I felt some regional version made sense, I would have incorporated it. But years later, when I returned to Mohini, I remembered the story which I'd left out the first time around because uh, it's not part of the Sanskrit uh, Veda Vyasa version of it. Uh, this is a South Indian Tamilian legend pertaining to the Mahabharata. And we have this uh, story about um, Ullupi's son, uh, Aravan, as he's called uh, in Tamil. So uh, it's believed in Tamil Nadu that um, on the eve of uh, battle, no, uh, it was uh, decided that they would have to perform a human sacrifice to ensure victory. And, uh, you know, they say that uh, uh, there were only uh, two candidates who were eligible for this uh, sacrifice because they had certain marks which were needed. One was to indicate flawless, flawlessness, basically. Uh, one was Krishna, the other one was uh, Aravan, Ullupi's uh, son by Arjuna. And uh, Aravan made this sacrifice. And uh, as a last wish, he asked that, uh, you know, he experienced the pressures, uh, the pleasures of uh, marital bliss. And he wanted a wife who would uh, mourn him after he was gone. And of course, uh, not many people were willing to, you know, fulfill his wish because, you know, uh, he literally, this girl would be a bride for just one night and she'll be widowed after that. Not exactly an enticing prospect in those days. But uh, Krishna uh, fixed it by offering Mohini as his bride. And uh, they celebrate that uh, festival at a place called uh, Kuvagam, where Mohini moans him like a mortal woman, where she lets her hair undone and when she breaks her bangles and moans him. So uh, it's this uh, charming story, uh, which is uh, celebrated. Uh, uh, and Aravan also is considered the patron, patron god of the queer com community. So, you know, I thought that story had um, uh, a lot of potential to be explored in Mohini. So it was very, uh, I kind of reinterpreted the existing legend and uh, uh, it was very satisfying when you keep your mind open and um, uh, when you're willing to soak in the possibilities. It's very interesting to see where that particular road leads you. Leads you. And I know that um, some people don't like us pay, uh, playing hard and fast and loose with this material but uh, you know um, i think if your uh, intentions are right when you really respect the material when you're just trying to understand because we have to remember that all these texts are subject to interpretation you know one particular community has been you know giving their interpretations of this text and we can't necessarily accept it as the gospel truth can be so everything is subject to interpretation and therefore we uh, rewrite the nar narrative in terms of uh, contemporary ideology. Why not? Why not? As long as you do justice to the story, I think uh, it's okay. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Anuja. And uh, my next question comes from something that uh, is faced by everybody, but women probably face a little more. And coincidentally, our uh, story prompt for the next season is Women's Silence, which has its own great history yeah. to it. My next question is about change of thought or tone, which is caused by distraction. While we are writing, there are a million things that distract us. For women, uh, the chances are far more than it is otherwise. Uh, how do you make sure that the, that the distraction doesn't distract you enough that you are writing something and suddenly, you know, I remember that uh, poem by poem Kubla Khan, that yeah. the poet was right writing and then he completely forgot the vision and he ended it in haste. Oh my God, such a masterpiece lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is your story, Anuja? How do you do it? Oh, it's, uh, it's like I said, you know, we would love to, you know, uh, 
go to that zone that quiet place where there's zero distractions but uh, i also feel that if such a place was made available to us distractions will still find a way because uh, that's just how the mind is you know the mind is always um, jumping around like it's a monkey or something so uh, a lot of it um, comes from finding that balance inside you finding a way to um, arrive at a core of tranquility even when there's chaos all around you because there's no keeping life out at the end of the day imagine you're writing a beautifully uh, you know the scene where two characters are making passionate love it has to be beautiful it has to be rom uh, romantic it has to be mystical it has to be just perfect and you know you have uh, your kid hammering on the door saying uh, you know her uh, her sister spilt her spilt paint all over her assignment and there's an almighty war going on out there so it's not like you can um, neglect your children and tell them give it a goddamn mist i'm working on something important here so it doesn't work that way kids couldn't give uh, less of a damn that mom's working on a major manuscript so you know it's um, like i said it's uh, about uh, you talked about women who have to balance uh, different roles right so <laughs> i think uh, i think uh, the very fact that we have to balance uh, balance our roles as a, as an author as a you know the, as someone who has to go out there and put out fires as and when they rise up all over the household i think we value the little time we get to spend on our writing and if we make that time of course we're going to get it uh, if we if we work hard for that and of course yeah uh, it, um, it, it can be frustrating because i was uh, reading about tennyson Okay. and uh, Ten Tennyson's wife Emily Selwood was like you know this goddess of uh, domestic bliss or something because uh, mm -hmm. I remember she was pregnant or something and uh, Tennyson was bitching to his friends who was writing notes or uh, letters to them saying you know I find it very tedious that uh, I have to look after uh, particulars about the household and it's interfering with my work when she heard about this instead of telling him to get a bloody grip and to suck it up uh, she worked harder to make sure that he wasn't uh, distracted at all you know so you you become a little uh, jealous when you read about women like this because uh, i don't think uh, we women have that kind of luxury of someone who's going to take care but i also think there's no point uh, dwelling on it and uh, you know thinking okay i've lost this uh, strand out here what if it doesn't come back you know, because that's not very productive and it's going to happen. Believe me, it's going to happen. You could be in the middle of the scene of your life and, uh, you know, something could happen to just break the stream of thought. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a monster getting it back. But when you work harder for it and when you finally get it back, when you finally reach the place where you were in, when you're back in the zone, you've used discipline to get back there. You've literally like clawed your way out of the mess. It is so sublimely satisfying. It makes it mm. entirely worthwhile, I feel. You know, despite all the hard work, despite the blood, sweat, tears, the irritation, when you get it right, when things come together for you, it's perfect, it's worth it. Absolutely. In fact, the example that you gave of uh, Tennyson, uh, there is something similar that my mother had pointed out some time back. Uh, she read out, in fact, a newspaper clip which is a letter written by Einstein to his wife uh, who wanted to come back into a, uh, a strange relationship just because uh, of the children. And he had handed her over a list of uh, terms, terms so that uh, he is not disturbed. And those terms include that you will not come to me unnecessarily. You will not disturb me. You will not do this. You will not do that. You will prepare food, but not expect me to be there for you in any way. So I think those were different times. And we have successfully, so thankfully, we are in different times. Uh, I, of course, decided that my son is not going to be a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, to add to what Anuja said about distraction, something I would like to add is so uh, this uh, once William Dalrymple had told me in one of the interviews uh, that human distraction, if it is totally necessary, we cannot avoid. But uh, if it is uh, digital distraction, it really helps if you switch off your mobile, keep it somewhere else, and keep your Facebook, Twitter shut down, and sit somewhere where 
you are not, you know, you are not, you cannot access these things because every 10 minutes we have this habit of, okay, let's see what is happening there. If that can, and I actually followed and I figured that boss, there is more time in life, you know. I had removed uh, Facebook from my mobile and I figured there's enough, there's quite some time. I mean, I didn't know that that time existed till the time my Facebook was on my mobile. So <laughs> that was quite a revelation. <laughs> uh, Anisha, my next question is about descriptions. When we are writing, uh, obviously, there's too much in us. I can see a question by Kushagra. I will take this question, Kushagra. Just hold on. Uh, this, what I want to ask you is about over description because when we write, often we end up writing too much because we have to prove our point. It is about we, you know, the person that is writing. It is very difficult to detach, and I really uh, felt it the hard way at times that it's very important and difficult uh, simultaneously to detach self from writing and uh, not do that over description to just pr prove our point that I am saying this is right or I am saying I am trying to say that this is how it is supposed to happen. We end up talking about our cause a little bit too much. We end up talking about how beautiful a, a woman is a little bit too much. Or we talk about how uh, bad a person is a little bit too much because we feel it that way. How do we keep that balance? How do we stop at the right moment? Uh, I think uh, I wrestled with the uh, description a little bit uh, while working on uh, Mohini. Uh, I think it's unavoidable because uh, Mohini has literally been boiled down to the fact that she's an exquisite creature, an enchantress. She's literally uh, reduced to her looks and uh, I wanted to avoid that. And um, I was thinking uh, how best to go about it because uh, there's no skirting around the fact that she was gorgeous. So I think uh, um, at that time, uh, I thought of uh, switching to the first person narrative uh, just so that you can hear her voice because uh, uh, I don't think even the most beautiful woman is going to run around because she doesn't look at herself, right? So maybe for her, it's just incidental. Maybe it's not something she sees. Maybe it's something which others see. So, you know, I think uh, that kind of uh, helped me uh, distance myself from that aspect of her while also drawing closer to other parts of her. So this was just a, a little technical thing which really helped for me. Uh, and I think another reason we writers, uh, uh, you know, get overly indulgent when it comes to description is because we like to show up a little bit also, uh, you know, just a little bit of uh, literary py pyrotechnics, I think, because uh, <laughs> you take your time to set yeah. a scene. I'll explain to you how great a writer I am and how good is my family. Excuse exactly. <laughs> Check out the gorgeousness of my prose. It's a bit of showing off right there. So uh, uh, I think that's where uh, editing comes in. No? You know, I think it was uh, Bernard Shaw who said that you have to write uh, drunk and edit when you're sober. Uh, I don't mean that literally. I don't think you need to get high to write. I think it will be counterproductive. But um, I can also understand what he meant when he said, because it feels like you're high on something on that world. You feel so alive and the words are just flowing. So at that time, you don't want to stop. You're, even if you're being indulgent, that's fine. But uh, when you go back, when you edit in the cold light of day, that's when you need to be a little stricter with yourself. You need to uh, try and step back from yourself and uh, just look at it as a manuscript and uh, uh, it helps when you dial it down when you go too far because you have to keep the reader in mind also uh, nobody wants to nobody is impressed by showing off actually so yeah so uh, it's more about the character about the story so you know uh, less is more that's what they always tell you it's, it, it applies to accessories i think it was uh, coco chanel who said that uh, before heading out of the house take one good hard look at yourself in the mirror and remove something <laughs> believe me <laughs> you're a little over accessory so just take something off so i try to keep that in mind i i ask myself is this necessary do you need to go on because sometimes i just go on and on and on and on and i'm so happy with the words actually and then later 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 maybe after I've done a few drafts, uh, I'll be thinking, my God, you're so irritating. <laughs> what the hell do you mean by going on and on and on and on? Just, you know, then you have to make like a butcher and just cut up the parts that uh, uh, that are a little too much, I guess. It, it'll help your book in the long run, so it needs to be done. Absolutely. I'll come to uh, Kushagra Mittal's question now. There's a beautiful thing that uh, he has written. 
this discussion reminds me of uh, Wolf's A Room of One's Own. Thank you. And uh, here's the question. What do you do when you feel you are losing the thread to a story while you are in the middle of writing it? Does switching to something else help? That's from Sneha, from Kuchagra's profile. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Sneha. Uh, so yeah, literally we lose the plot more often than we care to remember, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, there are certain, uh, first there's the blind panic. Let me acknowledge that. There's the profound sorrow, the heartbreak, when for various reasons you just uh, lose it. And yeah, there's the panic, you're like, oh my God, oh my God, what if I don't uh, get it back? What if I don't get it back? Uh, just breathe through it, breathe through it, breathe through it. Um, uh, I'll share something with you which uh, we learned in dance class. Uh, you know, um, when you dance, when you prepare for a show, you could work very hard, you could rehearse billions of times, and you could be just thorough with the choreography and um, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, when you're on stage, what happens on stage is what happens on stage, you know. Uh, it's, um, the, you know, your uh, proficiency as a dancer boils down to what you're capable of at that moment and not everything is in your control. Maybe uh, your anklets just fly across the stage, maybe your earrings uh, fall and you hurt yourself because you've stepped on it. The thing is to smile through it and continue performing. The show must go on. So she'll say that's when who you are as an artist comes to the fore. And I apply that to writing as well. Uh, shit happens. So, you know, no sense crying about it. Uh, you just have to figure it out. You just have to figure it out. And believe me, it's mostly about your will to keep going. Because there are thousand reasons why you should quit. Uh, you know, writing a manuscript, working on a book, a novel, a short story, it's never easy. There are so many other things which you could be doing instead. Uh, you know, so many reasons to quit. But you just need to keep going. You just, that's all it comes down to keep going and you'll be amazed uh, at how beautifully uh, things turn out eventually. It may be an entirely different thread you head out on, but that's also because I view the manuscript as a living, breathing creature. So maybe it wasn't meant to head in this direction. Maybe it was meant to uh, you know, uh, head out in another direction. So like I said, uh, just um, steer into the skid and uh, find a way to keep going. It's very, very... Um, um, it's not very glamorous work. You're pounding away, pounding away, pounding away, even if you're not sure what exactly you're doing, even if you don't even know why you're putting yourself through so much punishment. Just keep going. And believe me, persistence is key. If you can keep at it, it will be very, very rewarding, very, very satisfying in the long run. Uh, thank you so much, Anuja. There's uh, another question. Uh, this is from uh, Aishwam Mukherjee. Uh, he is logged in from his mother's profile, I think, Abhuddika Mukherjee. Would you say that planning most parts of the story before you write it, write it is better, or is writing most of it unplanned better? Okay, uh, so that's an interesting question. So planning question. or writing, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you that uh, the rules are there are no rules. Uh, the answer <laughs> is whatever the hell works for you. You know, sometimes uh, I do have uh, a rough uh, skeleton when I uh, do the research process. Um, I have some idea about how I want uh, the story to shape up. So, you know, when I'm writing my notes, uh, I, there's this skeleton which I intend to flesh out. Uh, and sometimes I'll be surprised at the end of the book, uh, maybe I uh, uh, fleshed it out the way I originally intended to. And at other times, the characters take me by surprise by, uh, you know, uh, doing by doing something entirely unexpected. But I count that as a win because that means, uh, you know, your characters have minds of their own. They are not just mouthpieces for you because uh, that's not uh, what you intend to do as, a, as an author. You know, you want your characters to have an autonomy that uh, they exist independent from you. And when they offer proof that that's exactly what they're doing, it's very, very uh, satisfying because you've done your job, right? So I like it uh, when the plot takes me by surprise. I like it when the characters pull stunts on me that I'm not prepared for. So yeah, um, uh, while crafting thrillers and stuff, uh, you know, um, maybe 
the details are very important maybe you need to uh, have a very clear idea about what you're doing beforehand so it depends on the genre depends on the kind of person you are uh, as i mean the kind of uh, uh, professional approach which you favor so but but then like i said there is no one size uh, fits all approach here uh, you have to figure out what works best for you and you also have to take into account uh, the interests of the particular plot you're en engaged in writing so all these uh, factor in and uh, you know just it's not about the choices themselves it's about making the choices work for you at the end of the day absolutely in fact uh, there's something that i always say anuja you know that uh, when the story writes itself and things are just progressing out of your control in fact it always happens with me i have never ever in my life planned my story it just doesn't happen with me and i tried planning and i ended up writing so bad that i scrapped it but then i have experienced that when that is happening the story is uh, flowing by its own and a little beyond control that is when probably uh, we enter our subconscious it is not exactly yeah. our conscious writing it is we have entered our subconscious and that is the most uh, as you say the most satisfied and the most uh, organic kind of writing where you have entered a space that you didn't ex know existed within you so uh, ayushman if you have felt that you are you have entered that space you are in a very beautiful space keep continuing with it uh, anuja last time i asked you about uh, over description and now i'll ask you something just the opposite which is about unstructured and incomplete ideas there are for some there are times when we are writing in a flow and certain ideas which could be very beautiful are uh, left a little incomplete a little unstructured or uh, we probably don't end up doing justice and by the time we progress with the story the story has progressed so when we are probably rereading we figure that this could have been a beautiful thing now if we have to change it a lot will have to be changed and otherwise we discard the idea something unstructured something could have been beautiful uh, i know that this question cannot have a one size fits all answer but then your perspective of it how to deal with it how i mean how would you face such a situation uh, it's like you said even uh, i'm happiest when uh, i feel that uh, the book is writing itself uh, that's the, that's the zone that's where you want to be in uh, but uh, yeah uh, the thing is you know sometimes um, uh, your head is just flooded with ideas and uh, you are convinced that um, they are all gems they probably are they probably are you know uh, maybe it is brilliant um, but um, the thing is uh, you know it's very very important uh, to ask yourself uh, whether you need to uh, retain everything that pops into your head you need to ask yourself if uh, maybe there was a reason you left it out while you were writing uh, sometimes the answer is no 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 if i incorporate this particular idea this particular theme uh, it will it would lend a certain depth to the narrative and uh, uh, that's a judgment call but uh, the uh, what i would say is uh, i mean the way i go about it is not to uh, force myself into doing anything not to shoehorn anything into the narrative uh, for instance a lot of us um, you know you've done it with ahalya and uh, uh, i've also tried to do it in my books where you kind of uh, um, bring in a feminist narrative because it's been solely lacking in traditional interpretations of this material yeah. but i'm also but the thing is uh, you also need to make sure that everything feels authentic you know uh, these were characters who lived in another age so you have to stay true to that as well so you know there's a certain technique of blending in feminist ideals without making it stick out like a sore thumb because if you haven't sold it just right you mentioned the word organic i love that word for writing it has to feel organic at the end of the day it has to feel natural so as long as you're not shoehorning something into the script i think uh, we are okay i think it's okay uh, we need not worry too much about the ideas that fell by the wayside maybe it wasn't right maybe this wasn't the uh, right place to express it maybe we can put them in the back burner maybe let them percolate a bit and see uh, whether there's room for them uh, in our future work or something like that true uh, my next question is something that every editor every author every kind of uh, personality who is engaged with any kind of writing 
half sin again and again and again, which is uh, showing over telling. Uh, that instead of telling people how is it, if we can show that, should create scenes where people are doing things and their actions are telling uh, things to them. Uh, two questions here. Uh, when you are showing, it means that a lot of things are left to the interpretation of the reader, yeah. which you may or may not want, or probably that somewhere I feel needs to be, uh, you know, we should have make a decision in our mind that if we are showing certain things, then it is open to interpretation. If we are telling it, that is more like a bullet point, one, two, three, four, I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this. So the message is very direct. And when we are showing, it is open to interpretation. It could be an interpretation which is very different from what you wanted to say. That is one. And second is, uh, I think you answer this one first, and then I'll come to the second, because I don't want to confuse you. OK. Uh, that's something which uh, I wrestle with a lot, because uh, uh, I'm a, uh, I think of myself as a very old-fashioned storyteller. Uh, that's how I started out, actually, you know, by uh, um, just telling, narrating these stories. So I do have a tendency uh, to tell rather than show. So it's something that I have to be uh, very alert to, because it's a fallibility uh, from my end. Uh, the problem with the uh, telling is also that uh, you mentioned it. It's like a bullet point presentation, and that's not very uh, interesting. That's the ma that's the main problem. It's like listening to a lecture or something, and you're going to people are going to just zone out when you head to that space where it's an information dump. Uh, nobody likes when that mm -hmm. happens. So, uh, like you mentioned, uh, when you uh, when you um, try to go about it by creating the scene where you know where you leave it open to interpretation uh, i love how you put that so uh, you know the thing is um, uh, in that way the reader feels like uh, they've actually been granted access to that world you know they've been transported from where they are to this beautiful world where they get to uh, where they have a bird's eye view of uh, the proceedings uh, it's like actually being at the coliseum you know when uh, the christians were thrown to the lions and uh, obviously that's where the excitement is isn't it uh, when you feel like you're part of the proceedings you, uh, the impact is lost when you describe what happened with nero and the christians and all but if you're actually there it's a whole new ball game so that's what you're trying to create you're trying to uh, transport the reader and in order to do that i've always felt that you need to be transported yourself then three-fourth of the job is done then you just you're just taking the reader along with you for the ride so um, I think we just need to um, uh, set aside the, you know, our personal funders, our personal agendas. You know, uh, we mean well. The intentions are always good. But uh, my dad always says the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So we need to also understand that we're a little close to this material. This material is too close to our heart. So a little bit of um, cl clinical detachment is called for. You need to step away. Uh, and let the story tell itself, let the characters breathe. Uh, it's sort of like how you raise children, right, Coral? We can't uh, be these helicopter moms who are hovering over their kids and, you know, trying to micromanage everything they do. You have to extend the same courtesy to your characters as well as the plot so that, like I said, you know, they can breathe and they can just be themselves. I think that's uh, how uh, I would go about tackling this particular thing. Absolutely. And, uh... The next question to this is, uh, many of us have this tendency, in fact, most of us have this tendency to see our characters, in, and we do it in our own ways. Uh, we tend to see our characters. We know when you wrote Arjun, I'm sure you knew how Arjun looked. When you wrote Mohini, you knew how Mohini looked, how Shiva looked. How did you do that visualization? Or, uh, I mean, what were the parameters? And how did you shape up? Because you must have shaped up the features, the kind of jewelry that she was wearing, or if she was not wearing. What was that process? And how did you describe your Mohini, the one, not the one on the cover, the one that you had in your mind? Well, um, actually, I'm glad you asked me this question. Uh, this was something uh, I've been doing from when I was a child. I think it's practically second nature to me. Uh, when I hear a story, or if there's this character, who captures my fancy, I instantly, you know, just slip under their skins in a manner of speaking, or I'm just, or they're just right there next to me. 
I have this weird ability <laughs> to teleport. I think <laughs> it's a super power. <laughs> it's a super power. I mean, not physically, okay, not physically like how they do it on X Men, and it's not even something I want. Uh, but uh, I think in my head, I've always been able to go wherever the hell I want. <laughs> it's like I could be in physics class, but I'll be a billion miles away. I think everyone can identify with that, right? You have this uh, hyperactive, uh, fertile imagination, so you're forever traveling in your head, you know, wherever you want to go. So I think uh, um, books let me do that. When I'm working on a book, I can just take off and. Uh, inhabit another world which is far removed from this one and uh, I think it's my uh, happy space it's like literally being given a pass into La La Land and uh, like you said whether it's Mohini or Arjuna it's like I'm holding hands with them and walking with them and you know it's real relationship here you know um, if you put this out of context, it makes you uh, sound like you have, uh, you know, maybe schizophrenia or something. But uh, for me, these characters are as real as you and anyone else who's a part of this session. You know, I think they are also very real. And um, it's like um, Albus Dumbledore says in Harry Potter, just because someone comes to you in a dream, it doesn't make them less real. So, you know, uh, that's how I think of it, that uh, these characters are very close to my heart, very real to me, a big part of my life, and I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, I just realized when you started speaking, I realized that the, he is Arjuna for you, and he is Arjun for me. So that's how <laughs> customized we have been with our, with our common love for Arjun. <laughs> I mean, it couldn't be more, uh, you know... Uh, funny that we are talking about it and this is where exactly it comes from. No, that actually, actually there's, there's one more origin. reason for that. There's one more reason for that. Um, if you spell my name backwards, it's Arjuna. And yeah. uh, my dad's name is Ramesh. So in school, on uh, the attendance register, my name would be R. Anuja. So if you put all that together, it's Arjuna. And I used to get a big <laughs> kick out of it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so, so pathetic. I remember when I was uh, writing Ahalya and uh, my editor did tell me, we will come to the editor's uh, thing in due course. I remember that she had told me that, why are you writing the names like this? Why Yudhishthir? Why uh, Arjun? I mean, shouldn't you add that A? And I was very much against it that, no, they're Bhim, they're Arjun, I know. <laughs> so there's another question from uh, Ayushman. It is how do you implement themes into your stories? Do you have any advice on doing these, implementing themes in your stories? Probably he is asking about genre, but even with or without genre, I think theme would be a different thing altogether. Well, again, with the themes and motives and uh, subtext and all that, uh, uh, it's like how when Coral asked about whether we go about it in a planned way, uh, structured way of its uh, unplanned. Uh, I tend not to get uh, too bogged down with uh, the technical aspects of it. I'm not thinking theme, I'm not thinking subtext, I'm not thinking of all those things. Um, uh, I, I prefer to let it happen very, very organically. Uh, you know, uh, when uh, later when people review my books or when they read it, they say, you know, I like this particular theme, I like that particular theme. And I'm always thinking that wasn't exactly at the forefront of my consciousness. Maybe it's uh, lurking somewhere in the periphery. You know, so uh, uh, for me, for me personally, it's not uh, something I dwell on because, like I said, uh, I try to focus on uh, the essence of what I'm trying to convey, and I don't articulate that even to myself. It's sort of like um, uh, instead of thinking about it, you just have to be. Uh, I think uh, if you, uh, I'm a Bruce Lee fan, so I will talk about Bruce Lee. See, that makes me sound ancient, but it's okay. Uh, so there's this movie called uh, Enter the Dragon, where Bruce Lee is coaching this young chap, and uh, he's uh, he asks him a question, and uh, this boy thinks, and he says he just hits him on the head. He says, "Don't think, feel." And since I love Bruce Lee, I took that advice to heart, maybe a little too much so, because I'm never thinking, and people are always yelling at me for not using my head. Uh, you know, I pre I prefer to go with the flow. I prefer to go by feel, I prefer to intuit. Uh, that's um, my modus operandi, I guess. It's worked for me. Uh, and uh, the, so I can only speak for myself. Uh, 
you know, I'm sure there are plenty of other authors who have different approaches. So whatever, again, whatever uh, you feel works for your material should be fine. Absolutely. Uh, actually, I think that uh, many of us authors are not even thinking about, and in fact, uh, that is not something binding on you. So uh, I don't think uh, genres are for publishing houses. Yeah. They need to categorize it. it because the they need to, yeah, <laughs> they need job. to put it in a particular shelf, yeah. right? That yeah. where is it placed on in which category it would show, and uh, which kind of readers would love it. But when it comes to an author, they are not thinking about themes or genre. They are just writing their story. So very uh, here, yes, 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 absolutely we are. Uh, there's a question from Neil Narvekar. Uh, hello, Anuja. From a political or commercial angle, have you felt anxiety about representing mythological characters in a way that might anger fanatical groups? Oh, 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 oh. OK. <laughs> Neil, that's a loaded question. Thank you. <laughs> See, uh, it's like uh, Coral said, uh, you know, uh, if you start, uh, we writers, if we start thinking about all that, if you start uh, thinking about the response to your book, uh, if you start worrying about whether you're going to piss off fanatical groups, like you mentioned, whether they may come after us with violence and threats and whatnot, uh, uh, all that analysis leads to paralysis, you know, you can't really function if you're frightened. Uh, and uh, you need to stay true to this material. And it is very sensitive. It's loaded material. So like I mentioned, uh, you know, you need to have your, uh, uh, you need to have good intentions and you need to be very respectful while uh, going about this uh, uh, this particular genre so that I, I i think i answer only to myself if i feel something is right i will go ahead and do it uh, uh, there there have been um, uh, instances when my editors have felt i've gone too far they'll say Amja, please Amja, please let's not ask for trouble and uh, of course the final creative decision lies with me but um, i think i'm a very reasonable person so if my editors feel strongly about it i will think about it there have been times when i said no uh, I've offered context for it and uh, we've talked about it and I may have uh, reworded it a little bit and decided to retain it or there were times when I've chosen to, uh, you know, maybe uh, make the cut. Uh, it's always better if you do it rather than someone else wielding the scissors on your baby. So it's my call. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to it. Uh, I take responsibility for every single word I've written and I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm very proud of it. And uh, yeah, there's no way uh, I'll ever apologize for anything because it comes from a good place. And you really can't um, please everyone all the time. You know, somebody is going to say, my God, uh, you guys are uh, you, you are just brilliant. And somebody else will say you should quit. You suck that bad. So, you know, you, you listen to the person who said you're brilliant. You're going to have a massive ego and your next uh, book is going to be full <laughs> of hot air, which is not good. And uh, somebody tells you suck, you should quit, and you quit, then please, uh, you're like literally not doing justice to yourself. So I, uh, I, um, I'm always grateful for readers' opinions, and uh, I'm grateful for the compliments. I'm also grateful for the insults because I'm always touched when people work. So I take it as a compliment. But at the end of the day, uh, it's not to be completely honest. Uh, I do not write for the sake of compliments. I do not. Um, art is its own reward. I sound so pompous when I say it, but uh, the work itself is so fulfilling uh, and I feel so lucky that I get to do what I love. So, you know, uh, I don't really um, uh, keep anything else in mind. I just think, okay, I'm grateful to be doing this. That's it. And uh, I, I don't think, I can't be thinking about extremists. I really can't afford to. Yeah, you know, uh, I was just uh, thinking about this that Neil asked. Uh, if you think about it, then uh, we got to know a little more about Salman Rushdie when his book was banned. Yes. So uh, everything has a positive side, yes. you know. Uh, there's a lot of publicity uh, that fanatical groups can bring to you. So it is just about how you look at it. Jokes apart, <laughs> jokes apart, those are definitely, as Anuja said, that those are never our audience. I mean. 
we never think of them see, uh, it's not in our hands right maybe uh, see it's not like i haven't flirted with the idea so sometimes <laughs> when a reader comes and says how come you're not in more trouble i'll be thinking maybe if i were in trouble like uh, salman rushdie or uh, uh, permal murgan recently i'll be thinking uh, you know maybe i'll be laughing all the way to the bank but the thing is uh, you know these things can if you uh, do it from a con i mean i don't think salman rushdie intended for this to happen or all those people Absolutely. whose books are banned they don't intend for it to happen they go through a lot of trauma also so you know it's basically it's not in your hands if you plan to write a controversial book you'll be transparent the readers aren't stupid and people don't like being manipulated i mean of course in today's social media age that can also pay off maybe but um, i don't know it's uh, uh it's it's really not in your hands it's really not in your hands so why worry about things that are not in your hands just exactly. do your best and uh, hope for the best <laughs> true anja my next question is about complicated plots mohini for example uh, is a very complicated uh, plot mohini as well as arjuna is a very uh, complicated character with too many layers too many turns too many things happening in one life span uh when we are writing a very complicated plot it becomes very difficult to keep people i mean of course that is not the way you think while you are writing but then end of the day that is what it comes down to that how do you keep the reader engaged because if Uh, these kind of lives mohini or arjuna the kind of stories that they have they are high drama uh, uh, features if i may call that so when every sentence in your life is a high drama thing it might be a great saga but it is a difficult life and when you are writing that down uh, that is becomes a very difficult job for the author herself as well Uh, how do you you know hammer it down to your floor no, no actually i think um, arjuna was uh, relatively straightforward because uh, i stayed faithful to the original material and uh, i think i uh, read and reread his stories so often from when i was a child uh, i had a definite idea about where i wanted arjuna to go so arjuna was actually uh, quite simple It was just that I was a first-time author, and I was dealing with nerves. And uh, you know, he was such a good friend. He held my hand all through it. So uh, Arjuna wasn't that um, insane. I think the complicated narratives would but be. But Arjuna was a, was married to a very complicated wife. So yeah, I know. But the, the, the problem is that the wife brought to Arjuna's life must have come a little bit to you. Did it? No, not really. With Arjuna, for me, really, I don't know. I think because uh, I don't know. Maybe it's the nature of my relationship with him. It was very simple, actually. Uh, there were only extraneous issues: the fact that I was pregnant with my second kid, stuff like that. Not Arjuna himself. Whereas uh, it was the same with Ganga and Kartikeya. Straightforward plots. They were relatively. They didn't drive me insane. I think the hardcore stuff would be Shakti and uh, Mohini. shakti was quite insane again when you're talking about the divine feminine it's not like you can uh, you know label her and file her away in a box shakti is too complicated there are too many threads there are too many faces to the mother goddess and uh, was a roller coaster ride and i think uh, people who knew me at the time they were worried i was going to have some kind of nervous uh, breakdown because there was just uh, you know, it was uh, the, it, it was literally like handling a live wire just something about the material something about the fact that uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, shakti worship itself by its very nature is very intense so you feel like you're tapping into the collective consciousness of people who are insane about the mother goddess who are so fanatically devoted to her just so much power you're handling and with mohini it was a different uh, kettle of fish because she's such a such an ephemeral presence it's uh, like you know chasing after a rainbow you know i think as a child every time i saw a rainbow i remember it's part of my earliest memories i'll see a rainbow i'll get insanely excited and i'll keep jumping 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 trying to you know just touch it somehow touch it i'll try and find a ladder i'll you know you i'm short even now i'm just five one so you know i'm a tiny little kid and i was so desperate to get my hands on that rainbow and uh, you know uh, i i just still remember how frantic i was when i you know when you keep grasping nothing you look in your hands there's nothing so it was like that with mohini such a uh, very very elusive presence you know it's like she'll just flirt uh, with you and just 
uh, dance away before you can draw close enough to her. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, that finally, after you know, some a couple of false starts, uh, you know, I really struggled with the beginning of Mohini. Uh, really, really struggled, and I think uh, I made that decision. I told you earlier, I made the decision to switch to the first person, to just you know, let her uh, to stop being so intimidated by her and. Uh, uh, you know, just let her tell her story in her own words. I think uh, that really, really helped. Uh, and it also made her very, very real for those who encountered her after that because it was her words. And uh, that was uh, just that small technical tweak. And uh, uh, it was like uh, it, threw, it, it was like the floodgates opened after that. And I found that I was able to keep track of the you know complicated threads of the narrative after that. Uh, Shakti, again, I think uh, I had to stop fighting myself. I had to stop uh, uh, trying to, uh, uh, this was just my third book, right? So I had to stop uh, getting in my own head so much, stop fighting my instincts so much, you know. So I, I just had to surrender to the flow of the words. Uh, and again, here was the first time I had a vague idea about where I wanted it to go, but things got completely out of control. And I think once I learned to surrender, just let it come, just let it come, don't panic, calm down. Once I reached that place, uh, it was more uh, enjoyable for me to write and uh, get a grip on things. It was a huge learning experience for me, uh, Shakti. It was like, if I can handle that, bring it, I can handle anything. <laughs> it was like that. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, tell you, Anuja, which I forgot to mention in the beginning uh, to you and the audience that uh, today, Shomrita Urni Ganguly was about to join me, but uh, she has apologized because uh, there was some emergency at uh, in her uh, place because, because of which she had to drop out. So the questions that I am asking you is not only my questions, those are also Shomrita's questions. I am just uh, filling up for her and she has told a hi to you. Uh, my next question is about drifting or muddled or conflicting point of view. Because we as human beings, at times, we have, uh, uh, as writers, we actually can see two different points of view. Uh, we can see the thing from this side as well as that side. Because when we are creating the hero, that is our character. And when we are creating the villain, that is also our character. So we get to see the uh, logic of both sides. And at times, it sounds like our, our own writing is conflicting each other, or it's, there's a contradiction. Have you ever faced that kind of a uh, thing in your writing, or how do you handle that? Uh, for me, I think uh, it's hard for me to take sides uh, as a rule. Uh, I think uh, I'm a veteran fence sitter, I think, which is a very uncomfortable position to take, actually, ideologically speaking. And at the same time, uh, I also have very strong opinions on some things. So, you know, it's a bit of a paradox. Uh, in my very nature, something uh, I wrestle with when I'm writing. Uh, but the thing is, I try not to um, let too much of myself uh, get in the way of the characters being themselves. So I try not to uh, bring judgment into it at all. So even if I'm writing about uh, a villainous character, someone's, someone who's been reviled in the mythological tradition, uh, uh, I don't see that person that way, that character that way, if, uh, while writing about a demon like uh, Mahishasra or Shambhara, or any of the, uh, you know, traditionally uh, hated villains. I don't look at it that way. I see uh, them, uh, I try to look at it from their P of POV also. And uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, background research to unearth why they did what they did. And uh, so it's not a question of me justifying anybody's uh, evil deeds or anything of the sort. It's me trying to provide context for each and every character's actions. And I do that very impartially, whether it's the hero or the villain. And uh, it's mm -hmm. always interesting to note that good people do a lot of bad things and uh, bad people also do a lot of good things. So I try to look for that uh, redemption arc for everyone because I genuinely don't think anybody's a lost cause. And uh, that's one of the most heartening things about uh, Indian mythology when you uh, dig into the backstories of these characters. Just a quick example. Uh, let's take. Let's talk about uh, the Dasavadars of Vishnu, which we mm -hmm. all we we're told the story from when we we're children. But uh, 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 the wonderful thing about in Indian mythology is uh, putting the pieces together from disparate threads. So if you go to the roots of the story behind the Dasavadars, uh, they talk about uh, Vishnu's gatekeepers, Jaya and Vijaya, and uh, the there were four Brahmins. 
uh, who went to visit Vishnu and the gatekeepers uh, barred passage and uh, they were cursed as a result uh, and uh, they were told that uh, they were unworthy of the exalted position they held so they were they were cursed and told that they will have to take birth on earth and uh, Vishnu uh, intervened on behalf of his uh, gatekeepers and uh, the, the Brahmins modified this curse. They said, uh, you can either choose to spend seven lifetimes away from Vishnu, uh, you will spend it as his devotees, you will contribute to his glory, you will sing songs in his praise, and uh, you know that's how you can make uh, atonement for what you've done. Or you can choose to spend three lifetimes as enemies of Vishnu. You will spend your lives hating him, you will spend your life swimming through an ocean of blood, till he comes and sets you free. And it was a simple choice for Jaya and Vijaya to make. They said, no, yeah. we will not spend seven lifetimes separated from him. Three lifetimes is too much. We will opt for three lifetimes as enemies of Vishnu. So which is why, you know, they were born as um, Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu, destroyed by the bow, Varaha and Narasimha. And uh, in Ramayana, they, they were born as Ravana and Kumbhakarna. And uh, later, in the Mahabharata as Shishupala and Dandavakra, who were slain by Krishna. So if you just look at Shishupala's story or Ravana's story, you will just see them as, uh, you know, as disgusting creatures who did awful things. But if you go into the backstory, you realize that it was a labor of love at the end of the day. So I know, you know, I, that's the kind of thing I like to present to my readers as well. You know, that we shouldn't be so quick to judge or condemn others because we don't always see the big picture. We don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. And until we do, it's best to reserve judgment and um, not think too harshly of anybody or anything. So that's how I tend to roll with uh, these characters. That is a very uh, important uh, thing that you have said, especially in this era when we are really, really fighting uh, being judged constantly. Uh, Ashwini Prabhakar has a question on the digital era itself. With so many content being churned out in this digital era, how can we as a writer make our voice heard and how important is it to have a voice? You oh, see, uh, Ashwini, I understand your concerns because, you know, so, uh, I don't know, if any field you get into, it's so hyper competitive. And as writers, we need our readers. You know, it's like uh, I recently read this, uh, read about this writer who said that it's like, uh, you know, you need two people to kiss. So it's the same. You need uh, a writer needs a reader. It's uh, that it's just you can't write uh, and, you know, hope uh, with the uh, thinking that, OK, nobody's going to read but I'm writing anyway. Because that's not how it works. So, yeah, I understand the anxiety because uh, I think even seasoned uh, uh, bestsellers and all, they probably have stay up at nights thinking, OK, my God, what if nobody reads my next book? What if it's not as big a success as the previous one? For first time authors, you think, what if my book is just a drop in the ocean and what if it vanishes without a trace? Uh, I, I don't have any uh, comfort to offer you as such because, again, this is not in your hand. OK, well, the fate of your book is not in your hand. All you can do is, uh, you know, um, do your best work, put everything you have into it, put a piece of your heart, your soul, and uh, you've given your book wings, you know, uh, where it flies is its own business. You really have to detach yourself from that part of it because otherwise it can really drive you crazy. So why worry about things uh, over which you have no control, right? So maybe it will be a, uh, be a bestseller tomorrow. Maybe it will be a bestseller 10 years from now. And uh, see, even if it's not, a, uh, even if it hasn't sold a million copies, it's not, it, it doesn't necessarily translate into failure. If somebody who needs your story gets your hands, uh, gets their hands on your book, if they are comforted by it, if they are entertained by it, why not count it as a win, right? It's uh, ultimately, uh, isn't that why we do what we do, to just make a little bit of a difference uh, in someone's life, especially if they need it, if they need the comfort of your story, uh, you know, maybe it reached the right people. So maybe that's all that matters at the end of the day. Very true. Uh, you know, um, I have uh, two questions which I'll merge here because they might be interrelated. One is about the monotone when we are writing. One person is writing, so it can just say straight and cause some kind of, if I may say so, some kind of boredom for the reader while reading if it is too monotonic. 
and uh, the other thing that also comes with it though they, it is not the same is predictability where you know the writer the reader knows what is coming next how can we i mean you know take care of these two one is monotone which is too direct too straight too uh, simple uh, simple or complicated whatever the idea is monotone and the second is predictability where the reader knows what's coming and lose interest in between See, now again, uh, when it comes to the question of uh, monotony and uh, boredom, uh, who decides? Who decides whether, uh, now if you take, uh, uh, I, I hear lots of readers uh, complaining about uh, these award-winning books, uh, the books which have been judged to have, uh, you know, high levels of literary merit. And uh, readers are always saying, my God, it's so bloody boring. I couldn't uh, <laughs> sit through two pages I slept off. And uh, I say that, uh, see, tastes are varied. They are subjective. I, I genuinely feel that when it comes to the classics and although they are, uh, lots of people could find them monotonous or boring, if you stick with them, you'll find that actually it's uh, it, it, it's those books are classics for a reason. Those books have received awards for a reason. But sometimes uh, I I'm also like that some uh, some majorly uh, fetid author. I don't know when I read their book, I just want to kill myself. It's that boring. So uh, you know, again, it's entirely subjective. One one man's meat is another man's poison. To a cliche here but uh, it's true so you don't know maybe one person will find it monotonous maybe somebody else finds it interesting what you can do is stay faithful um, to your own voice you know your voice is distinctive it's quirky it's unique it's you so you know uh, have faith in yourself believe in your voice and like i said you just need to watch out for indulgence self-indulgence uh, and you need to set aside ego when you're going about this uh, other than that you can't really um, you know um, uh, think about things like whether you're being monotonous or boring. If you feel that, you can always, uh, you know, ask for a second or third opinion. That's why we have editors, actually. Uh, I can't stress the importance of a good editor when it comes to shaping the final outcome of your book. So, you know, sometimes you need a strong hand to, uh, to pull you back when you've gone too far, uh, to encourage you to, uh, you know, go further when you've pulled back. So it's a collaborative process at times. And uh, we writers... Uh, automatically resist editors because you know like i said uh, your book is your baby and you don't want someone saying oh look oh, the baby's eyes are a little too close the baby's a little skinny now nah? so you don't you, you get bloody pissed off when people do that uh, but again like i said uh, you need to respect your editor's voice if it makes sense you know you need to just um, be willing to listen to the suggestions offered so in that way you can avoid uh, uh, pitfalls like uh, monotony and uh, predictability so if, the, if you kind of telegraph in 10, uh, you know, five chapters uh, before, uh, you know, un the plot unfolds, then again, maybe you lose the reader. But again, this is uh, technical finesse, actually. And uh, it would apply more for thrillers and uh, mysteries and stuff like that, where it's crucial. Um, whereas uh, Coral and I, uh, I think we belong to a certain category of writers uh, who are very much into Virginia Woolf's uh, stream of consciousness type of writing. Uh, we just go with the flow and uh, see where it takes us. So if you're writing like that, when you're in the zone, believe me, it won't be predictable because the author herself doesn't know where the hell she's <laughs> so We take ourselves by surprise, so automatically we're going to take the reader also by surprise. But uh, see, again, it comes down to genre. And again, that is the editor's job. You know, they'll kind of like um, have to work with you on it. And again, when it comes to thrillers and mysteries and genres like that, it is a bit like uh, putting together pieces of a puzzle. So you need to be more meticulous when it comes to that kind of thing. And uh, you'll have to talk to thriller writers, I guess. There are some uh, audience questions waiting. I'll just take them after my last question. I will only wait, uh, take the audience questions. Uh, Anuja, my last question is something that will probably make you smile. That is the editor's reaction. Uh, many of us who, I mean, many of uh, those who are hearing this out, many of them are aspiring writers. They want to be authors in the long run. And uh, you probably remember the shock that came to us when the first editorial feedback had come to us after our first book. And uh, I have heard many fun uh, anecdotes from authors I myself have mine. Would you like to prepare the aspiring authors about how they should treat their editors and what they should expect from their editors if 
it is the first feedback they're re receiving from them. Actually, it's like I said, you know, an editor's job is so tricky. <laughs> and we writers are such uh, super sensitive folks. Uh, I think uh, when I was pitching Arjuna uh, to a lot of publishing houses, uh, there was this memorable, <laughs> rather unpleasant encounter with an editor. Uh, this editor who belongs to a leading publishing house, you know, uh, she sends me this rejection email thing. Uh, we were so excited about, uh, you know, working with you on a book about Arjuna. But we were hoping that it's the story of Arjuna set against the backdrop of the Mahabharata. And I'm like, what the hell, man? It is the story of Arjuna set against the backdrop of the Mahabharata. What the hell? Is she high or am I high? So <laughs> I didn't know what to make of it. And I was so depressed. I was like, what the hell? Maybe editors are crazy people. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think all these... <laughs> I think... Uh, <laughs> You have to go through fire <laughs> to get your book published, and uh, yeah, uh, eventually I wound up with an awesome editor for Arjuna, and uh, you know she also wasn't exactly editors. Uh, you know they use words very sparingly, so uh, if you're expecting an editor to wax eloquent about your brilliance, forget about it. <laughs> I just want to say, yeah. Uh, it's quite a good concept, uh, but it will need a lot of editing and I look forward to working with you on that. So they'll tell you something like that. And you were hoping for, <laughs> you were hoping to be started with grace, I think. It never goes down that way. But once in a while, very rarely, uh, in the editorial comment section, the editor will say, oh, I love this bit, I so agree with this. You know, it's rare and so I value it all the more. I'll be like, oh, this one, this portion of the book worked for her, yay. So stuff like that. So editors, but uh, seriously, you, you've got to respect them. That's a thankless job. I'm sure if you were to interview editors, they'll tell you, my God, authors are so bloody full of them. <laughs> Working with their bloody egos is such a pain. So <laughs> we have a lot of stories about authors also. So, But we need each other at the end of the day. And uh, hopefully be a relationship where there's mutual respect. And then it's very, very rewarding. Uh, it kind of works out for everybody. Yeah, you know, I remember that my first book when the edit came, I mean, I always have had very, very good relationship with my editors. I mean, I always wanted it that way and I kept it that way. But I remember that when the first edit came, I was like, oh, you know, first, Ekto, that track change mode was, it just slaps you on the face. All it's the like a, lines. Yeah, it's like a teacher correcting and writing comments doesn't <laughs> make sense. So... And you're like, what? I'm loving. And you just go back to that stage of KGR1 where you have opened your test copy and you have seen that you have received two out of 20. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those things were really funny. And then when the next book happened, I almost, I mean, I had done it and then I had almost started expecting that this, these portions she will chop. And I was, I had already started being very apprehensive towards the editor that she is the one to chop. Huh? So she is a bad person. So on the face of Edward it, I was being, her hands. Edward her hands. On the face of it, I was being very nice. Hi, G. Hello, G. But in my mind, it was like she will chop my breast portions. Monster. <laughs> So I think that is something. But end of the day, when you hear out, when you hear things like from the readers, that it is crisp and free flow, and I read it at one go. You know how important uh, an editor is, and yeah. without her, how lost you would be. Sure, so be prepared that for that. I will take the questions now. There's one more question from Ashwini Prabhakar. Uh, she asks: Sometimes our character takes to realms of emotions that the author is unfamiliar with. So how can an author depict it with 100% sincerity without following into stereotypical scenarios or cliches? Yeah, the emotions actually, uh, that, yeah. yeah actually, uh, that's a, a very interesting question because, uh, uh, for instance, I'm not that uh, comfortable writing about uh, romance or um, uh, sexually explicit scenes, I think. I think uh, I'm a very fastidious person, somewhat reserved, introverted. So, you know, I, uh, I, I'm not big on love stories. And yet, uh, you know, lots of, I'm always surprised when um, people come and say they enjoy the romantic threads in my uh, books. So uh, I, I'm always a little surprised and uh, I'm always very gratified when I hear that. 
uh, i think the key is to remember that uh, it's like i said earlier uh, your characters uh, you know aren't a reflection of you they aren't mouthpieces for your ideas for your thoughts so uh, see when you treat them like that uh, you're not uh, being very fair to them you know because uh, they are their own people and uh, they have minds of their own that's when you know you've succeeded as an author when your characters start talking to you so again uh, you have to stay true to this character you have to stay true to that particular uh, situation uh, without putting yourself in there without trying to uh, you know force your voice into their mouths in a manner of speaking so you know like you mentioned some of these emotions would be hard for you to relate with maybe a uh, relate to maybe a sadist uh, maybe somebody who skilled so many and that's not really your cup of tea is it and yet like you said it has to be authentic so uh, it's i'll again go back to bruce lee and i'll give you his advice which was uh, you know don't think feel surrender to that moment let the character do his or her thing you know because uh, it's not really it's their world just let them be there and uh, just you know, rebuild that world and let them lose they let them free there let them express themselves uh, as they see fit and which is why uh, coral and i told you sometimes the characters take us by surprise with their actions uh, and i also mentioned uh, the importance of uh, having a back story for your characters you need to understand where they come from and once you do that once you have an insight into their psyche it will start making a, a degree of sense and you will have no difficulty portraying them you need to uh, know why they did what they did where it came from what drove them to that point uh, i am a psychology major so i think i'm not I'm, again it's an area of interest for me i don't uh, you know uh, i don't focus on the deed itself and think oh god that's despicable or that's um, that's really disgusting or whatever uh, i try to leave judgment out of it i take a few steps back and you try to explore the uh, just probe the character psyche and then it will help you portray them with authenticity and relatability also actually thank you there is one question from kanika khatter and uh, i will just put that across to you uh, she says that she uh, has just started writing fiction uh, before this she was doing more of uh, technical writing which is more logic and less creative so she felt that at like at times she was running out of ideas in between and so she wants to know is there any protocol that she should follow daily to make sure that she doesn't struggle much and keeps the ideas flowing in i think she is talking about the kind of exercises that can enhance her creativity Oh, see, that sounds like uh, something which students of creative writing would do. And uh, now I did take a creative writing course in college, but uh, see, I'm not really uh, uh, following a textbook or a manual at this point to keep the ideas flowing. And uh, uh, see, uh, creativity is not something you can, you know, have like a dog on a leash or anything of the sort. Creativity comes and goes. There'll be days when the ideas are so multi, uh, you know. Um, are so many you know they're just flooding your head and uh, you don't know what to do with the ideas and other days you'll have zero ideas so be prepared for that extreme state um, and uh, uh, just um, inspiration is everywhere so just keep your eyes open for it and if you actually want some sort of uh, exercise or technique i would suggest maybe you could keep an ideas journal uh, every time something pops into your head write it down i mean it doesn't mean uh, a book is going to emerge from it immediately but maybe you know it could lead to something else and something will happen so just note it down without any kind of judgment or any kind of expectation don't have too many expectations from yourself so um, you know you just need to um, let the ideas pour in and uh, when you read newspaper some particular uh, case or uh, headline grabs your attention you could write about that story in your own words and uh, put it away in a vault a mental vault so maybe uh, at some point it could show up in a story or something like that so that's the suggestion in fact you know anuja i'll uh, add to that kanika one thing that you can do is that when you are writing a story i mean at least you have the character in mind uh, uh, gross or uh, just a story idea in mind it's very important for you to see the characters something that we have already spoken about and anuja has uh, explained that process of seeing the character in your mind i think one exercise that you can always do is just when you are uh, going to sleep and you are you know uh, in by yourself you don't have distractions at that time if you could just try to see that character with every detail you know that how the character looks the features of the face the kind of 
jewelry that he or she would choose if he or she has to, the kind of clothes that they would wear, the shoes, uh, whether he is muscular or whether she is uh, she's a sporty, you know, each and every basic detail, like throughout the day, the different hours that we have, what would that character do if left alone? What would that character do in the kind of situation that you are putting that person into? So not all of these details you will require in the story. But when you are very specifically uh, uh, committed to finding your character with such inherent details, it might actually help you in your story with more points, more creativity, because you may not write that she didn't, uh, she never wanted to make eggs for breakfast, but you can just put that breakfast was served and she grimaced uh, upon seeing the egg. You know, that adds layers to your story that enriches the way you are writing the story. So these kind of exercises might just help you. Uh, I think, um, Anuja, there's one question from Shampurna Majumdar. There are two questions, in fact, I'll go one by one. First is how to go about experimenting with narrative styles. See, First again, person, uh, narrative, second person. Yeah. You see, uh, like I said, uh, it, uh, it comes down to the demands of your character, of your plot. So. Uh, yeah, uh, it's always good to experiment, you know, trial and error so that you can uh, uh, you can always uh, use trial and error to find uh, what suits you best, perhaps, and uh, uh, what feels, uh, again, it's a question of uh, intuition, what feels right for a particular character or for a plot. So it comes down to you. It's a judgment call which you will have to make. Sure. And finally, uh, one more question from Kanika Khatte before I go to Aishman's uh, question. How can I assess uh, creativity in my writing? Any quick techniques that I can follow? How to assess creativity? This is something that Anuja has spoken about. But Anuja, would you like to add anything? That how to assess the creativity and if there is there a way, any technique See, you're which you can follow to understand? not the best person to judge that. See, if you're uh, uh, into writing and stuff like that, uh, if you have an artistic frame of mind, it follows that uh, you, know, uh, you have uh, a vein of creativity uh, unique to you. So, uh, you know. Um, that goes without saying, but uh, uh, I, I don't know. I think we all uh, have certain ideas when it comes to ourselves, and uh, it's best to uh, get an outside opinion, uh, a neutral party's opinion about these things, if you care to ascertain exactly where you stand in terms of creativity. So. Okay. The last question is from uh, Ayushman. That is, what are the steps for publishing a book or a story? I think see, uh, a lot of people would want to know this. Uh, see, uh, I'll just tell you what worked for me. Uh, I, I think uh, it's best to, before you pitch your novel or whatever, I personally prefer to finish it, to make sure it's completed. Because, uh, you know, the, your publishers prefer it. They'd rather not take a leap of faith. You might pitch something and unless uh, it's a non-fiction or uh, you're already an established writer, you know, making a pitch is not going to really help you win a contract. So it's best to have a complete manuscript so that in case they ask you for a few sample chapters, if they, in case they ask you for a detailed synopsis, they may ask you for these things. So, uh, you know, you, you're ready, you're good to go, you're prepared. And uh, after you finish writing your manuscript, don't think all the hard work is done because it's just beginning. Uh, you need to uh, work on your pitch. You need to study submission guidelines of each publishing house. And please don't choose one publisher and say, ah, they are my favorites, I'm sending it to them. Because just send it to everybody out there, international, national, just send it to everyone, send it to all the agents and hope that something, uh, somebody responds because it's going to be a long process. Uh, patience is key. You'll go mad waiting for them to respond, but you will have to be patient uh, and you have to be persistent. You know, and little little things count. Uh, publishers get ten thousand, uh, you know, submissions on a given day. The competition is intense, as we pointed out. So simple things like making mistakes in the submission guidelines would result in your manuscript being filtered out. Okay, so don't make careless mistakes. Don't think my manuscript is great. The publisher just has to give me a chance. Pay attention to what they've asked you to do. There are certain instructions they've given you. Please send three sample chapters. Have this in the header have this in the subject, follow all that. That's all very tedious work, but please don't think you're too good for that. No, nobody isn't. Uh, so 
do all those things properly uh, write your uh, synopsis and all very briefly don't send lengthy stuff to them they are busy people they can't be pouring over uh, five billion word emails so keep it concise and crisp make your best possible pitch uh, be positive and uh, yeah don't give up don't give up easily uh, develop a thick hide because you will you will deal with a lot of rejection <laughs> Good luck, good luck on your publishing journey, all of you who are absolutely, to absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so I think we have uh, taken all the questions. Anuja, thank you so much for being there and for uh, answering so many of our questions with uh, so much patience. It was really lovely hearing you. Such a pleasure, Colin. Thanks so much. Thank you. And uh, to the audience, uh, season two of the writing program, the registrations are on. You are welcome to register. Thank you so much for hearing us out. Anuja, thank you once again as we take it off, uh, off the line. Uh, have a great time, everybody. Thank you so much.